And while the children are making their way out to their classes, why don't we go ahead and lift up our Bible or our tablet or iPhone, whatever it is that we study the scriptures with, and let's make our weekly declaration together, shall we? This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for teaching, and for correction. <laughs> I believe everything it says. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, <laughs> Amen. And Amen. Threw you for a loop there, didn't I? Well, in his book, Three Steps Forward and Two Steps Backward, Charles Swindoll states that, quote, We are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And such was the case with Gideon and his 300 men defeating 135,000 of their enemies. It was a brilliantly disguised impossible situation and yet it resulted in a great opportunity and one of the greatest victories of war that has ever occurred in the history of the world and perhaps the greatest. But as is often the case, Gideon and the entire book of Judges is just one story after another of God's people taking three steps forward and two steps backward. And we're going to see this pattern emerge again this morning as we look at the remainder of Judges chapter 8. And so uh, if you have not yet turned there, I would encourage you uh, to do so. Judges is in your Old Testament. It is after uh, Joshua and it is before uh, the book of Ruth, Judges chapter 8, and we'll be picking up uh, this morning in verse 22. Now, uh, to give you a little review of last week, you might remember that God uh, commissioned Gideon assigned Gideon the task of defeating this uh, great army. And so Gideon assembles together uh, 32,000 soldiers, and uh, God told Gideon that's too many to go fight against these 135,000 swordsmen. And so uh, God began to downsize Gideon's army. He began to uh, uh, whittle them down to a group of 300 men who were focused, they were uh, filled with faith, and they were filled also with fortitude. And it's these three things with the grace of God that enabled them to greatly defeat their enemies. And so it is in light of this great victory that the children of Israel have just experienced over their enemies that we pick up in verse 22 of chapter 8, and it says this. It says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, <clears throat> I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Great couple of verses. 
Now, you may remember that these were the very people that are asking Gideon to rule over him. They're the ones that refused to help Gideon and his weary army when they were pursuing their enemies. We're told that uh, the, uh, the children of Israel, the army, these 300 men were weary, yet they were pursuing. And they were so tired, they were so weary, and they asked this city... Uh, uh, for some bread <laughs> so that they can be energized to continue on in their uh, journey in defeating the enemies of, of God. But this city said no to them. And they mocked them, actually, Scripture says. And they went to another city, and they did the same thing. <laughs> and so these are the very people who are saying to Gideon, rule over us. Interesting. After Gideon's victory, they say, rule over us. Not only you, but your son and your son's son. Let them rule over us. In other words, what they are saying is this. Gideon, let's build a dynasty in your name where you will rule over us and your sons will rule over us and their sons will rule over us. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> some people are drawn, drawn to power. Some people's quest in life is to climb the ladder so that they might get as high and as lofty as possible. And the quest for power has ruined many people throughout history. But Gideon, notice that he refuses a position of power over these people's lives. Gideon, at this point in time, saw himself as a servant of God and not a ruler of man. He says, no, I'm not going to rule over you. Let God rule over you. <laughs> this reminds me of what uh, the Apostle Paul wrote <laughs> to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. And this is the amplified version. He says, not that we rule like dictators over your faith, but rather we work with you for the increase of your joy, for in your faith <coughs> you stand firm. The contemporary English version uses the word boss or bosses. We, we're, we're not seeking to be bosses of your faith. King James Version uses the word dominion. We're not seeking dominion or rulership over you. New American Standard uh, Bible uses the word Lord. For we do not seek the Lord over your faith. And we discover here in both the words of Gideon and the Apostle Paul an important truth, and it is this. Man may provide a type of spiritual covering, but it is only God who should rule over and control our lives. And loved ones, the greatest leaders are those who point people to God and not to themselves. You see, true leaders do not want to control you. They want to release you into God's destiny for your life. And so, religion seeks to control. Relationship seeks to create. Let me say that again. Religion seeks to control. Relationship seeks to create. And in this, Gideon was encouraging these people to create a healthy relationship with God and with others by placing God as Lord over their lives and not any man. And of course, this is the way that it should be. This is the very thing that we all need to do. And that is we honor man, but ultimately we bow to God. You see, I don't mind someone covering me. As a matter of fact, I think that's a, a healthy thing. I appreciate and I value the covering that the elders provide for me in my leadership here at the church. 
And so I don't mind covering. But I resist to my very core someone who seeks to control me. Can I hear an amen? amen? And so covering should never be confused with controlling. But let me just add another thought here, and it's this. <laughs> there needs to be more teaching in the church today about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. There needs to be more teaching in the church today about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We don't hear a lot <coughs> about that these days. We, we prefer to think of Jesus as our friend or as our Savior or, or as Abba, which are all terms of affection and, and endearment. And, and that's really popular today, and rightly so, because all of those things are part of his nature. All of those things are part of his character that we love to relate to and that we should relate to, especially if you've come out of a legalistic background. But Philippians tells us this. Philippians tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord <laughs> to the glory of God the Father. And so we must understand that true Christianity, true uh, discipleship <laughs> is based upon the lordship of Jesus over our lives. And listen, Jesus was Lord <laughs> way before he became our Savior or our friend. You know, uh, oftentimes, my best friend Scott, <clears throat> when praying, he, he opens his prayer with the word master. That's how he opens up, master. And it puts things in perspective right away, doesn't it? And so, our prayers must be filled with both affection towards Christ as well as the recognition of the authority of Christ. Simply put, affection and authority must merge together as one because without each other they are not complete. Now, we read on in verse 24. <clears throat> so they're asking Gideon to rule over them. And yet Gideon said to them, I'm not going to rule over you, but I would request of you that each of you give me an earring from his spoil, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they said, we will surely give them. And so they spread out a garment, and every one of them threw an earring there from his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. <coughs> Beside, listen, the crescent ornaments and the pendants of the people's robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the neck bands that were on the camel's necks. Now, <laughs> this is a very interesting <laughs> portion of scripture because what we see here is that even though that Gideon was not interested in power, he was very, very much interested in wealth. <laughs> Gideon asked for these golden <laughs> earrings and so 1,700 shekels worth, they, 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 they just fill up this tablecloth that they had laid out. <laughs> And then notice he also wanted the golden bands and the, the golden crescent <coughs> ornaments that were around the camel's necks. <laughs> Loved ones, think about this for a moment. What religion is associated with a crescent moon? Just let that sink in for a moment. Very significant stuff. 
And so, where Gideon, he wasn't tempted with power, he was tempted with prosperity. As a matter of fact, notice that 1 Timothy 6.10 says this. Would you guys read this out loud with me? Let's begin. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs or many sorrows. You see... <laughs> The result of this very verse is that Gideon succumbs to this temptation for wealth and he allows compromise back into his life. And we discover in this that we all have areas of weakness and how if we are not careful to guard our hearts and to guard our minds, we too will be tempted to compromise in one area or another. Now I think it's also important to point out that Gideon was weary from the battle. We saw this earlier in verse 4, weary yet pursuing. And so here Gideon, he gave it <coughs> his very best. <coughs> Excuse me. And sometimes, though, in, in moments of weakness, we do things that we wouldn't do otherwise. Have you discovered that? We might think things, we might say things, we might do things that are contrary to our Christian faith that we would not do in a moment of strength. We do do in a moment of weakness. And so let us always be careful, guys, what we do and what we want in moments of weakness and weariness, because weariness and weakness can tear down our resistance in regarding things that tempt us. And so, what is interesting here is that we see Gideon's hypocrisy. We see Gideon's duplicity, and um, let us be clear of this one thing. We all have areas of duplicity in our lives, right? We, we all have this struggle. We can all play the hypocrite. We, we, we all have times of duplicity where there is a lack of consistency in what we believe and what we actually do or say. And so Gideon's is being exposed here. He tells others that they should submit to the lordship of God. But he fails to do the very thing himself due to his love and lust for wealth. And as a result, the entire nation of Israel, which had just been delivered from the enemy's hands, they become enslaved again to idolatry. And so, loved ones, please hear this. We must be careful of the decisions we make because more than often they will impact more than just ourselves. Let me say that again. We must be careful of the decisions we make because more often than not they impact more than just ourselves. They impact others. And we see here that what actually happens is that Gideon committed the same sin as his father, Joash. Oh, how the sins and the iniquities of the fathers are passed on to their children. He does the same thing that his father, Joash, did. He created an idol. He created a false god that served as a snare. Not only to his entire household, but also the entire nation of Israel. You see, ju just like the children of Israel <clears throat> built for themselves a golden calf <laughs> uh, while they were wandering in the wilderness, we see here that they are marveling over this golden ephah that uh, uh, Gideon had built as a result of all the gold that he had gathered. The earrings, the pendulums, the, 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 the bands, the, the, the crescent moons. 
And he builds this ephod, and an ephod is basically a, a very, very fancy, expensive vest. And they're marveling at this. But you see, the only thing we should marvel at is that the Lord is our God. <laughs> and God is our Lord. Now, I also want to point out, this is something I heard John Corson uh, say, a great teacher. He used to be my pastor many moons ago. And he says that when God wants to do something in a church or in a city or uh, in a nation, he chooses a man. Or in some cases, like Deborah, he chooses a woman. But in this case, Ivy's going, yes. He, but in this case, he chooses a man. And with that man, he gives them a ministry. Or excuse me, he gives them a mission. And out of that mission comes a ministry. And then oftentimes, out of that ministry is birth a movement. Uh, so a man given a mission that results in a ministry that gives birth to a movement. But you see, if we are not careful, the man, the mission, the ministry, or the movement can turn into a monument that becomes idolized. And I would add that monuments... Man-made monuments can oftentimes result in madness because people feel compelled to point to them and protect them and praise them for what they represent. They become something holy, something idolized. This, this movement that has become a, a monument. And look what we have done. And in doing so, the idol is born. And that's exactly what we are seeing here in Judges chapter 8. Gideon did not want to rule over them, but he did want money and a monument to remind everyone of how God used him to defeat their enemies. And so they set this thing up in their home, and it becomes a snare and a stumbling block, not only to his household, but also the entire nation of Israel. And so here's the deal. The, the war was over, but there were landmines that still remained. And the same thing is true with us. Jesus has won the war on the cross. <laughs> but <clears throat> there's still some landmines that are out there that we need to avoid. But Gideon in his prosperity, and his popularity, he lets his guard down and he stepped onto one of these landmines and it literally crippled his walk with God. Now, we read on in verse 28. <coughs> it says, So Midian was subdued before the sons of Israel, and they did not lift up their heads anymore. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years in the days of Gideon. And then Jerubal, that's also the name of Gideon, Jerubal, the son of Joash, went and lived <coughs> in his own house. And so... I find this very interesting, these uh, two verses. I find it interesting how the Holy Spirit uses the name Jerubal in verse 29 after this great failure on the part of Gideon when he succumbs to uh, this urge for prosperity and popularity. I find it interesting that the Holy Spirit would cho choose this word because this was the name that his father gave Gideon when he destroyed the idols of Baal and Asherah. And when he tore these idols down, his father said, and your name will be Jerubal, which means let Baal contend with him. 
And I believe that this was intentional by the Holy Spirit because, listen, despite Gideon's weaknesses and failures, God did not want us to forget that he was also Jerubal, the guy who contended with Baal and won. And this is such an amazing and reassuring truth of how God chooses to see us in our strength and not in our weaknesses. He sees us as victors and not as victims. And despite his weakness, Gideon goes down in history in Hebrews chapter 11 as a hero and not a zero. You see, man may choose to think, well, he went from zero to hero and back to zero. <laughs> Not in God's eyes. God made sure that his name was enshrined in the scriptures for us to remember as a hero of the faith. Hebrews chapter 11. That's what God wanted us to remember about Gideon. Verse 30. It says, Now Gideon had 70 sons. He was very busy after his retirement. <laughs> who were his direct descendants, for he had many wives. We, we, we don't read about that prior to his great victory. His concubine, now a concubine was legally a wife, but like a second class wife in their caste system that they had back there. So legally a wife, but a second class wife. His concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he named him Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a ripe old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Aborazites. And we're going to learn about Abimelech next week. <laughs> Verse 33, then it came about, as soon as Gideon was dead that the sons of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal beareth their God. And the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the household of Jerubal, that is Gideon, in accord with all the good that he had done to Israel. Oh, how easy we forget. And so we read that the children of Israel, they have peace for 40 years. And this also just once again reveals the grace and the mercy of God towards his sons and, and daughters. They begin to idolize this golden ephah. It becomes a snare to them. And yet God allows them to experience rest and, and, and peace for 40 years. We're told that Gideon dies a ripe old age, and after his death, the nation of Israel once again forgets the true and living God, and they return to worshiping false gods. Just think about that. Guys, hear this. Let me just say this. Maybe, maybe somebody needs to hear this today. If the world is so appealing to you right now, would you please remember why you left it in the first place? Let me say that again. If the world and all of its trappings and lights and bells and smells are so tempting to you right now, would you please remember why you chose to leave it 
in the first place? How easy we forget the moment we first believed. And why we believed. And why we made that choice. And why we made that commitment. And why we made that declaration. Because at that moment, revelation came and we saw the reality of darkness versus light. And it became clear to us <laughs> that we had just been spending our lives following after false gods that only offer false hope. And so, this is what the children of Israel do. On top of that, we're told that they failed to show kindness to Gideon's household. And so here we see how the children of Israel took three steps forward and two steps backward. And loved ones, my exhortation to us all is that we too can do the same thing when we fail to accept and acknowledge the Lordship of God over our lives. And you know, perhaps that's exactly how you feel this morning. That your Christian journey is a series of three steps forward and two steps backward. You make progress, and then you go backwards. You make progress, and then you go backwards. You make progress, and then you go backwards. Guys, please hear this. Pay attention. Scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Let's read this out loud together, shall we? For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. Let's read that again. For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. You see, even the righteous stumble and fall from time to time. But the key is that after they stumble, they rise again. They don't give up or give in. They don't throw in the towel. And guys, may that be our testimony as well. Listen, not, not that we live perfect lives, but that despite our struggles, we have resolved to rise and move forward in the things of God. As I was <laughs> studying for this morning's message, a story came to my mind that I'd like to close with. The story involves a lady who brought her <clears throat> son, just a little boy, six, seven, eight years old, to a concert hall to hear a great pianist play because the boy had begun showing interest in the piano and this woman loved uh, uh, piano and this type of, of music. And so they're there in the hall, it's filling up in this concert hall and she's talking with the people that are next to her and just getting caught up in the excitement and the conversation and, and then all of a <coughs> sudden uh, they, they start hearing the sound of a piano playing. And the woman looks around and her child is nowhere to be found. I'm sure this has never happened to anyone. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. No. And so she looks around and is aghast that she can't find her son. She looks up on the stage and sure enough... Because he's just started playing the piano. He's there on the stool in front of the piano and he's playing chopsticks and he's not doing a good job at it. <laughs> and she is just petrified. And she, she's just frozen. She doesn't know what, what to do. And all of a sudden from the side of the stage comes this master concert pianist. And he's just beelining it right to the piano. And she's thinking, oh no, he's going to get rebuked. He's going he's gonna to embarrass my, my child in front of all of these people. And the 
the uh, pianist came and he sat down right next to the child who's stumbling and bumbling with playing chopsticks. And everybody's attention are now to this child. And the master musician didn't chastise him. He didn't say, get off the stage. So what are you doing? Get out of here. Who do you think you are? No. He sat down and he said this to the boy. He said, keep going. That's right. I'm right here. I'm helping you. And he started to play along with him. Keep it up. You're doing good. Don't stop. Keep going. You can do it. Listen to the sound now. Listen to the music now. I'm right here with you. Keep playing. Keep going. That's right. Don't stop. And you see, loved ones, the same thing is true with you and with me. <laughs> when we're on the stage of, of life and we're trying to fiddle our way and stumble our way through the chopsticks that we've learned thus far. And it's not looking too good. It's not sounding too good. People are watching us and they're concerned. <laughs> That's when our master comes rushing in upon the stage of our lives and he sits down next to us and he says, I'm here. Keep going. Don't stop. You can do it. I'm right here with you. See how good it sounds now? You can do it. Keep going. Keep going. Don't stop. And that's the message for us all today. Three steps forward, two steps backward. But the Master comes, and He cheers us on because He believes in us. And He knows that our destiny is to be victors, not to be victims. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? <laughs> We're going to close in this prayer. <laughs> Let's pray this out loud together. Let's begin. Jesus, today, despite our stumbling and struggles, we declare you as both Savior and Lord. Thank you that when we take three steps forward and two steps backward, that you choose to see the best in us and not the worst. And when we fall, give us the grace and resolve to rise again. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask the elders and the prayer team to come forward. We're going to close in a song of worship to the Lord. Perhaps something about today's message spoke to you. <laughs> Perhaps you feel that you're on the stage of your life and everyone's <laughs> looking at you and watching you and it doesn't sound good. It doesn't look good. God's not embarrassed. God's not surprised. And He will come alongside of us and cheer us on. And if you need to be cheered on today with a, a simple prayer of faith and encouragement, we want to encourage you to come and be prayed for. If you have health issues, financial challenges, relationship things, we want to pray with you. We want to pray that even though you may have stumbled and fall in these areas, that you would have the resolve and the wisdom to rise again and to continue to move on in the things of God. And should you be here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, <laughs> He loves you so much. He saw this world stumbling and bumbling around, lost in darkness, and He rushed upon the stage of our lives with an urgency. And he came and he dwelt amongst us. And he died for my sins and for your sins. So that we might be forgiven. And be given a future in the hope. And that promise is to all who would believe. 
You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't bargain for it. It's a free gift, but you do have to receive it. Now, I would encourage you, if you've never done that, I want to encourage you, receive that gift today. It's a great gift of Christmas. Christ himself. New life. God bless you guys. Keep moving on. God's cheering you on.
we thank you that you are so holy, God, that you are perfect, Lord, that you are like no other God. We just thank you for who you are. <laughs> You're our Father. We thank you that you came down to earth, Lord, and that even in your holiness, you, you came down and became a man, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for meeting us at our level, God, and raising us, seating us in heavenly places with you, Jesus. We just thank you so much that you are for us, Lord, that you love us and that you encourage us, God, that you carry us when we need to be carried, Lord. Father, I pray that you would bless us with deeper revelation of who you are in this season of Advent and Christmas, Lord. I pray that Jesus, you just reveal to us more about your nature and your humility and your um, just your servanthood and, and your great love for us, God. Thank you, Father. We just worship you. We praise you, God, for you're so good and you're so good to us, Lord. Pray that you'd go out with us this week, Lord. Speak to us. Um, help us to obey your voice, God. Thank you, Father. Be our strength this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, say amen. Amen. amen.